Behind your back. Behind your back. Behind your back. Behind your back. Many of us remember the infamous To Catch a Predator show hosted by Chris Hansen, where the focus was on exposing adults engaging in <laughs> conversations with minors and attempting to meet them. But have you ever wondered what happens to these individuals after they're apprehended? Sit down! On the ground! On the ground! Join us as we delve into the aftermath for these predators and explore where they are now. Number 10. Mike Manzi. Mike Manzi, once a math tutor, found himself thrust into infamy following an encounter with Chris Hansen on the To Catch a Predator show. In a pivotal episode, Manzi's attempt to explain his presence at a sting house turned into a moment of public humiliation. Despite his desperate plea, Manzi was arrested and subjected to a 35-minute interrogation. Fortunately for him, his prior online interactions were relatively clean, resulting in a sentence of three years probation without imprisonment or registration on any watch lists. However, the repercussions of his televised ordeal have been far-reaching. Leaked conversations revealed familial ties between Manzi and the show's security head, Ron Knight, who happened to be his uncle. Manzi's attempt to appeal to his familial connection for leniency backfired, leading to a strained relationship with his uncle and likely contributing to the deterioration of other family ties. Interestingly, it was disclosed that Manzi was a former viewer of To Catch a Predator, which explained his immediate recognition of Chris Hansen. Despite attempts to move on from his past, Manzi's life took a downward spiral. He was discovered on a felony dating site and identified on Facebook under an alias. Conversations with him revealed a man struggling with recognition and the aftermath of his notoriety. In a stark contrast to his previous career as a tutor for affluent families in Connecticut, Manzi's current employment situation appears bleak. Recent photos depict him working in retail and residing with his parents, marking a significant fall from his once established position in society. Despite the image portrayed on screen, those who interact with him describe a chilled out demeanor, leaving many to ponder the complexities of redemption and forgiveness in the age of public scrutiny. I'm really not here for any I really can't. Please do not but look at the chat. Number 9. Jeff Sokol. Jeff Sokol's journey post, To Catch a Predator, paints a stark picture of the lasting impact of public scrutiny. Sokol's infamous appearance on the show, marked by his casual consumption of pizza amidst confrontation, earned him a lasting place in internet lore. Despite his nonchalant during the encounter, Sokol's legal battles were far from easy. Following three different legal representations, Sokol found himself sentenced to two and a half years in prison, commencing in May 2017. His incarceration only fueled the fascination with his episode, leading fans to track down the restaurant where he ordered his pizza. The eatery saw a surge in patronage, with many customers requesting the Sokol special, referencing his notorious appearance. Despite rumors of the restaurant's plea to cease the requests, evidence remains elusive. Upon his release in June 2019, Sokol attempted to distance himself from his past by legally petitioning to change his name to Sonny Derek Porter. In a heartfelt plea, Sokol expressed remorse for his actions and a desire for a fresh start, yet his request for a name change was ultimately denied, further subjecting him to online Forced to sell his apartment, Sokol reportedly moved in with his parents, suggesting a fall from his previous status. Despite efforts to rebuild his life, Sokol maintained a low profile, with the most recent sighting dating back to early 2021. While once a prominent figure on the show, Sokol has since retreated from public view, navigating the challenges of redemption and second chances in the digital age. Number 8. Stacey Kendall Stanley Kendall's appearance on To Catch a Predator sent shockwaves through the community, particularly when he admitted to being a middle school math teacher. Despite his tenure of 23 years in education, he vehemently denied engaging in any conversations with students, citing his Christian beliefs as a deterrent against such behavior, albeit in a manner met with skepticism by Chris Hansen. During his arrest and subsequent police interview, Stanley's concern for his teaching career was palpable. He expressed anxiety about his future as an educator and seemed more preoccupied with the potential fallout than remorse for his actions. Despite his bail being set at $50,000, Stanley's charges, along with those of other predators from the show, were eventually dropped following 
following the tragic death of Assistant District Attorney Louis Conrad. Despite avoiding legal consequences, Stanley's teaching license was permanently revoked by the Texas Education Agency. However, in a surprising turn of events, he resurfaced in Warsaw, Indiana in 2013, where he obtained a substitute teacher license at Plymouth Public School. His past caught up with him when someone recognized him, prompting an investigation that revealed his history as a substitute teacher across multiple districts. Efforts to transfer him to another district were thwarted when his background came to light, resulting in his removal from the education system once again. The most disturbing aspect of Stanley Kendall's story lies in the fact that all his charges were dropped. Despite clear evidence against him, the controversy surrounding of another individual led to the dismissal of his case, along with those of others who appeared on the show. It's a chilling reminder of how the legal system can sometimes fail to deliver justice, especially in cases involving <laughs> What's even more concerning is that Stanley continued teaching for seven years after the incident, despite having his teaching license revoked. With his career options limited, he seemingly spent his free time engaging in questionable activities, including online interactions with unknown individuals. One particularly infamous video surfaced online. While the context behind these actions remains unconfirmed, they serve as a stark indication that Stanley never truly changed and remained the same reprehensible individual as when he first appeared on the show. Additionally, during this period, Stanley's health began to deteriorate, and just two years after the video's emergence, he succumbed to colon cancer on May 31, 2017. It's a sobering end to a troubling saga, highlighting the consequences of unchecked behavior and the importance of accountability. Number 7. John Kennelly John Kennelly, who gained notoriety after being accosted twice in one day. He was having a chats with a boy he thought to be 14 years old while going by the online persona Special Guy 29. They would eventually come together at the Sting House. He arrived at the first meeting carrying a 12-pack of beer and entirely <laughs> Chris Hansen would approach the individual and inquire about his actions before allowing the dummy to leave. John would stop him in mid-sentence to clarify that he was just chatting. Later, when John left the house, it was thought that he had learned his lesson. However, this was completely untrue as he was back talking to kids online less than a day after being discovered. He went by Special Guy 29 on the screen, but changed his given name to Shane. They decided to meet at a nearby McDonald's while messaging the dummy. He had to say this out of shock when he was challenged while waiting outside. John subsequently disclosed that he was seeing a doctor and that a recent death in his family was the cause of his behavior. John walks away from the altercation and gets into his car, but he wasn't going to get away with it so simply. Following this, the police conducted an apartment raid in order to seize his computer. John Kennedy was then taken into custody and faced charges from the Commonwealth for using communication devices. A guilty plea would mitigate the charges, which originally carried a maximum 10-year prison sentence. Later that year, in September 2006, he was instead ordered to have no contact with anybody under the age of 18, be registered as a lifelong and be suspended to prison for two years, along with three years of probation. It wasn't over yet, though, since the second encounter revealed that John had not taken the lesson to heart. A mere year later, in March 2007, two 15-year-old girls were strolling through Cub Run Park when they came across a man. Later on, the individual was found to be none other than John Kennelly. This time, he violated his and was charged with two counts of exposure. It was unclear if he was given an extension of his or further jail time. He was taken into custody at an adult detention facility. Where is he now then? A fan of To Catch a Predator saw him on June 2022 at a hotel in Southwest Pennsylvania. As of October 2022, the latest available data from the Virginia Registry indicated that John was recorded as being without employment. Number 6. John Dupey John Dupey, whose life took a downward spiral following his appearance on the show, now finds himself homeless. His eerie demeanor upon entering the Sting House left the decoy shaken, with mere proximity to him evoking fear. Despite his unsettling presence, he claimed to be there solely to watch football, a facade swiftly shattered when it emerged that he was simultaneously engaging with multiple Subsequent to his arrest and interrogation, John faced a tumultuous court appearance where he was met with 
and ridicule from attendees as he pleaded guilty. The judge, compelled to restore order amidst the chaos, intervened to ensure a semblance of decorum. Ultimately, John Dupé was sentenced to eight years in prison, commencing in August 2016. Tragedy struck just four months into his incarceration, when both of John's siblings perished in a car accident on the very street where the Stinghouse stood. Amidst this devastating loss, Rumors circulate that John was further alienated by his parents following the televised ordeal. After serving a mere two years of his sentence, John was released from prison in July 2018. However, his freedom came at the cost of being listed on a public offender registry, with his address marked as a Connecticut homeless shelter. Though he managed to transition to a group house after three years, his probation violation in October 2021 led to another stint in prison, this time for a year and two months. Since his release in December 2022, John has sought refuge in a shelter catering to individuals in recovery from addiction, his life mired in a cycle of hardship and adversity. Number 5. Joshua Colon. Joshua Colon found himself in legal woes once more, breaching his probation terms in a recent incident. Known as the New York plumber caught in a sting operation, he infamously sealed his fate by unwittingly walking into a setup, expressing his dread of appearing on a Chris Hansen show. In a surreal twist, upon exiting the bathroom, he faced Chris Hansen's presence, promptly recognizing the infamous host. In a moment of startling candor, Josh confessed to his intentions, setting off a chain of events that culminated in a seven-year prison sentence. Prior to his incarceration, Josh, still employed as a plumber, confided in a colleague about his deep remorse and desire to reconcile with his former partner. He harbored haunting thoughts of loneliness and the bleak prospect of a normal life slipping away. His imprisonment commenced in early 2016, serving three years of his sentence. However, this setback marked only the beginning of a recurrent cycle. In September 2020, just a year after his release, news circulated on online forums of Joshua's conviction for violating his probation terms, resulting in a four-year prison term, with six months served and nine years of probation looming. His incarceration came to an end in March 2021. Josh's explanation adds a curious layer to his troubled narrative. Narrative. Presently, a search for his name on inmate databases suggests his residency in the Connecticut Department of Corrections, igniting speculation about a potential third for Joshua Colon. His story unfolds as a cautionary tale of legal entanglements and the enduring consequences of past actions. Number 4. Jesse Velez Jesse Velez feigned disgust when his texts were read aloud to him, despite his insistence that he didn't text a 13-year-old boy. It took the 13-year-old youngster only 20 minutes after creating his Grinder account to locate Jesse. They agreed to meet after exchanging ominous texts and requests. Jesse informed the boy he looked a lot older and appeared perplexed when he got to the residence. The youngster refused to give over his ID, saying he kept it in his mother's handbag, which he was unable to present as she wasn't home. Abruptly, Chris Hansen would walk into the kitchen and start questioning Jesse. He would the messages and even show him the images of himself that he had sent. Jesse Velez ultimately served two of his five years of jail sentence and had to register as a for 10 years. Soon later, Jesse apologized for his behavior on Facebook in a now-deleted post that elicited a range of responses. He said, other people want to look at me funny and call me names, near the end of his remarks. One thing you can do, though, is question yourself in the mirror if bullying will harm you. Stop holding my actions against me and let me deal with it and don't judge me based on what you read, yeah boy Jesse. This perception of Jesse Velez as lacking remorse and playing the victim resonated with many observers, casting doubt on the sincerity of his apology and suggesting a troubling pattern of behavior. Despite facing significant legal consequences in 2016, his subsequent return to prison in 2018 and again in 2020 for breaching a restraining order only reinforced these concerns. His apparent inability to steer clear of trouble despite prior incarceration, raised questions about his willingness to take responsibility for his actions and make genuine efforts towards rehabilitation. Moreover, insights into Jesse's past, such as the incidents involving his mobile phone store being robbed in 2014, shed light on his history. While some may see these events as fortuitous for the community, sparing them from potential harm, others may view them as indicative of deeper issues plaguing Jesse's life. The recurring theme of legal entanglements and questionable behavior underscores the complexities of addressing predatory tendencies and the challenges of achieving genuine rehabilitation. Jesse Velez's story serves as a stark reminder of the enduring consequences of 
behavior, and the imperative of vigilance in safeguarding vulnerable individuals from exploitation. Number 3. Lorne Armstrong After engaging in numerous chats and phone calls with a Lorne eagerly anticipated their planned meeting, coinciding with his 37th birthday. However, his excitement was not solely due to the prospect of meeting the girl, it was also fueled by the occasion. Yet his rendezvous took a sharp turn when confronted by Chris Hansen. In a feeble attempt to justify his actions, Lorne attributed his behavior to a previous experience with a woman he knew as Amanda James. However, his explanations fell short as he attempted to flee, only to be swiftly intercepted by officers. Get down! On the ground, on the ground. During police interviews, Lorne initially cooperated, consenting to searches of his computer and truck, despite harboring incriminating evidence. However, his demeanor shifted upon the revelation of a nude picture of himself, prompting a sudden request for legal representation. As authorities delved deeper, Lorne found himself unable to provide explanations for his actions, further exacerbating his predicament. The mounting evidence against him left him increasingly defenseless, underscoring the gravity of his offenses and the futility of his attempts to evade accountability. Due to the charges brought against him, Lorne faced the daunting prospect of a 20-year prison sentence. To mitigate the severity of his punishment, he opted for a plea deal, resulting in a reduced sentence of seven years to be served concurrently at both state and federal levels. After completing five years of his term, he was released but remained under lifetime probation, compelled to register as a <laughs> Determined to turn his life around, Lorne embarked on a new venture in 2017 by creating a YouTube channel. Initially featuring content centered around guitar tutorials, updates, workouts, and cooking demonstrations, his channel garnered some attention. However, Lorne found himself grappling with his notoriety, as viewers primarily associated him with his past transgressions. In a bid to reclaim control over his narrative and bolster his fledgling business endeavors, Lorne made a strategic decision to capitalize on his infamy. Incorporating shameless self-promotion into his videos, he sought to generate interest in his t-shirt business. One of his marketing ploys involved selling shirts emblazoned with the slogan, Don't yell at me, I'm sensitive. This development represented a stark contrast contradiction to a statement Lorne made while on the show. However, due to legal constraints, he found himself unable to profit from the sale of the shirt. Not only did he utilize an image from the show, infringing on copyright laws, but he also encountered restrictions imposed by the Son of Sam law, which prohibits criminals from profiting off their offenses. Despite these obstacles, one curious individual actually purchased the shirt for $40, though it remains uncertain whether it was ever shipped. This solitary sale proved to be a dismal failure for his business venture. Adding to his woes, 2017 brought about a that rocked Lorne's world. An individual going by the name Ramona initiated a long-distance relationship with him, ostensibly to delve into his character. Recordings of their conversations, including Lorne's candid reflections on his to-catch-a-predator appearance and personal insecurities, were uploaded online. However, this scheme quickly spiraled out of control as others attempted to deceive him, plunging Lorne into further turmoil. Amidst these setbacks, Lorne's string of misfortune continued into 2019 compounding his challenges and highlighting the relentless obstacles he faced in his quest for redemption. During this tumultuous period, Lorne found himself embroiled in further legal troubles, culminating in yet another arrest. Despite spending five years in a rehabilitation class, he failed to pass due to his refusal to take responsibility for his past actions. Reports even surfaced of Lorne attending one of these classes inebriated, signaling a blatant disregard for the seriousness of his situation. Compounding his woes, Lorne faced additional restrictions, including a ban on accessing the internet, effectively halting his activity on his YouTube channel. As he languished in prison, he attempted to channel his experiences into creative endeavors, penning a novel titled titled Taken Abroad. However, the book received dismal reviews, as readers were unwilling to support someone with such a tainted reputation. Lorne's notoriety reached new heights with the emergence of the Church of Cod, a religious group established solely Exploiting his crimes and past misdeeds, members of this group confronted him in person, subjecting him to public and the depth of animosity towards Lorne was further evident when a video surfaced in May 2021, showing him selling items at a garage sale while bystanders cruelly taunted him with quotes from his To Catch a Predator appearance. 
The culmination of Lorne's downward spiral came in January 2023 when the Church of Cod, in an act of derision, pointed out on Google Maps that he no longer resided in Cornville, Arizona. His trailer, where he had been living, was reportedly destroyed, marking a symbolic end to this chapter of his troubled life. Number 2. Stephen Buchanan Stephen Buchanan's infamy stems from his alarming actions at the Sting House, where he arrived equipped with duct tape, a camera, and an array of weapons in his car. Rather than entering the house, he attempted to lure the decoy into his vehicle, heightening the sense of dread and danger. When confronted by Chris Hansen, Buchanan sought to excuse his depravity by attributing it to post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD stemming from his military service in Iraq. Despite invoking this defense, Buchanan was sentenced to three years in prison. However, scrutiny from fans of the show cast doubt on Buchanan's narrative. A Reddit user under the pseudonym Bud1985 meticulously investigated Buchanan's claims and revealed a starkly different reality. According to Bud1985's post, Buchanan served as a tank mechanic during his time in Iraq, never participating in combat or missions. This revelation contradicted Buchanan's assertions of experiencing combat-related PTSD, sparking outrage among those who served alongside him. The most recent photo of Stephen Buchanan, dated July 2022, was shared alongside an update from Chris Hansen's podcast. As far as our investigation reveals, Stephen Buchanan continues to reside in Connecticut with his parents while working as a truck driver. In an attempt to gather further information, Chris personally reached out to Stephen's father by calling the provided number associated with Stephen Buchanan. A man, whose voice bore resemblance to Stephen Buchanan's, answered the call. Upon inquiring for Stephen, the man promptly recognized Chris Hansen. Acknowledging the reason for his call, Chris explained that he was seeking to speak with Stephen Buchanan. In a tone tinged with weariness, the man, presumably Stephen's father, expressed frustration with the circumstances surrounding his son. He conveyed that Stephen has moved forward with his life and emphasized the importance of looking towards the future. Subsequently, he politely requested that Chris Hansen refrain from contacting the number again. Number 1. Charles Lawrence the curious case of Charles Lawrence, the affluent accountant recognized by Chris from their encounters on the train, presents a perplexing narrative. Upon entering the Sting House, Charles's incredulous response, No, Chris, what are you doing? underscored the shock of being caught in the act. Arrested and brought in for interrogation, Charles attempted to deflect blame with a comical excuse, attributing his inappropriate behavior to poor eyesight, claiming he mistook the decoy's ages as 18 instead of 13. However, his feeble attempt to elude accountability fell flat in court, where the judge saw through the facade, sentencing him to two years behind bars, served from June 2016 to June 2018. While incarcerated, the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, under which Lawrence was employed, terminated his membership due to a final judgment of conviction for a crime punishable by imprisonment exceeding one year. Despite his background as an accountant, Charles also held a position as a commercial real estate agent, evident from his LinkedIn profile, where he is listed as the president of Lawrence Real Estate Enterprises, Inc., a company that remains active to this day. However, Chris hinted at complications regarding Charles's licensure, casting doubt on his continued involvement in the real estate sector post-conviction. In the aftermath of his legal troubles, Charles's prospects for employment in his former fields seem bleak. Reports surfaced in May 2021, detailing sightings of Charles residing in an over-55s complex, corroborated by information obtained from his public offender registry listing. The accompanying photo, dated to mid-2018, offers a glimpse of Charles's appearance post-incarceration, painting a somber picture of his circumstances. As the details surrounding Charles Lawrence's life post-incarceration come to light, it's evident that his once prominent professional stature has been tarnished by his indiscretions. Despite attempts to rebuild his life, the shadow of his past transgressions looms large, impacting his career prospects and social standing. Charles's story serves as a cautionary tale, highlighting the enduring consequences of unethical behavior and the challenges of redemption in the face of public scrutiny. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.